Before Vin Diesel became the face of the long-running and lucrative franchise focused on fast cars and... Family. Family. It's family. You got family. He made an impression lurking in the shadows as interstellar convict Richard B. Riddick in the 2000 sci-fi thriller Pitch Black. But actually getting that movie made was almost harder than surviving an onslaught of hungry beasts on a desolate planet. Grab your goggles and take a look at what the f**k happened to this movie. Pitch Black began its life at production company Interscope as a script called Nightfall by Jim and Ken Wheat. The original pitch followed a group of unlucky space travelers stranded on a planet where an eclipse occurs, and then vicious ghosts emerge from the darkness to attack the visitors. However, neither the ghost idea nor the Wheat Brothers made it to later drafts. Seeking to find the full potential of the killer concept, Interscope approached filmmaker David Toohey about the project. As a writer, Toohey's resume included movies like the Harrison Ford hit The Fugitive, the cult genre favorite Warlock, Ridley Scott's G.I. Jane, and, somewhat to his disappointment, Critters 2. Toohey had just come off the Charlie Sheen sci-fi thriller The Arrival, and while that movie was not a box office success, it demonstrated he was capable of handling aliens, special effects, and directing his own scripts. Interscope told him that if he could improve the Nightfall script to their satisfaction, he could direct it as well. Besides the title change, Tui set about injecting more energy and intensity into the story, but mainly turned his focus to the characters. While he was influenced by Ridley Scott's classic Alien and its realistic characters dealing with an extraterrestrial terror, Tui's approach was for the savage creatures to be the catalyst that reveals the inner nature of his characters. He also wanted to subvert audience expectations with the direction his characters go, like a stoic lawman who's actually a selfish addict, and a pilot perceived as a hero, but who had considered sacrificing her passengers in a crisis. And of course, there was the movie's now iconic anti-hero. The outlaw in the original Nightfall script was a secondary character, a female space barbarian named Krieg. Tui brought the convict to the forefront and transformed them into Richard B. Riddick, a notorious killer who turns out to be the survivor's only salvation. For his rewrite, Tui drew substantial inspiration from the 1953 French film The Wages of Fear, later remade as William Friedkin's troubled 1977 thriller Sorcerer, about desperate men hired to rapidly transport unstable explosives over dangerous terrain. Tui adopted its elements of unpredictable characters, sweaty tension, and a looming deadline and applied them to a science fiction setting. For casting, Tui convinced the producers to stick with talented unknowns, both to restrict the budget and to keep audiences guessing who might live or die. Radha Mitchell landed the role of transport docking pilot Carolyn Fry. Cole Hauser, who had also auditioned to play Riddick, instead got the part of his nemesis, Johns, a bounty hunter and morphine junkie. Veteran character actor Keith David would play a Muslim imam on a pilgrimage with three young men, and the remaining cast was populated with Australian actors like Louis Fitzgerald and Farscape's Claudia Black. But even as he was already in Australia scouting locations and building sets, Tui still had a major hole in his cast. While he mostly got his way casting relative unknowns, the investors wanted a popular actor in the role of Riddick. The producers had sent the script to none other than Steven Seagal, and the action star was interested in the role. However, Tui was also well aware of Seagal's infamous reputation for being a nightmare to work with, and he unconditionally refused to cast him. The executives initially threatened that Tui would have to use Seagal or not make the movie at all, but the director would not budge. Ultimately, the producers relented and even had a suggestion of their own, Vin Diesel. Interscope had been working with the then up-and-coming actor on a film project about his time as a bouncer at New York City nightclubs. Diesel had seen the pitch black script and taken a shine to the character of Riddick and auditioned for the part. Tui was not impressed with Diesel's cold reading, but he did think the actor had an edgy quality that suited the sly space felon, and he hoped Diesel's passion for the part would translate on screen. The rest, as they say, is history. It ain't me you gotta worry about. For the movie's lethal nocturnal predators, the filmmakers went to creature designer Patrick Tatopoulos, who had worked on Stargate, Independence Day, and the 1998 Godzilla. After several months of tweaking the designs for the large carnivores and small swarmers, they finally dialed in on a blind hammerhead style with echolocation emitters, and visual effects supervisor Peter Chang began figuring out how to create the monsters with CGI. 
To replicate the desolate environment of a stark alien world, the production went to the small Australian opal mining town of Cooper Pedy, which featured 360 degrees of barren horizon and had previously provided the post-apocalyptic wastes of Mad Max beyond Thunderdome. In order to avoid the region's unbearable summer heat and accompanying fly infestation, the movie would film in the middle of the Australian winter when it would be too cool for the insects to thrive and interfere with the production's outdoor shoot. However, filming in winter also meant a limit of eight hours of sunlight each day, which was inconvenient and ironic for an alien planet with three blazing suns. When cameras started rolling, the location could best be described as uncooperative, Inconsistent and inexplicable weather produced severe thunder and lightning, 80 mile an hour winds, or driving rain on an almost daily basis, transforming what was meant to be an arid setting into an area caked with mud thick enough to strand production vehicles. Tui described the environment as hostile to both the characters and the filmmakers. Just two weeks into the shoot, the extreme weather had already put the production a week behind schedule. The movie was filming on sacred aboriginal ground, and although they had received proper approval, the filmmakers started to wonder if they had been cursed. Fearing he'd get dismissed from the movie for falling behind so drastically, Tui said the hope of making great cinema suddenly took a back seat to just catching up, and the process quickly became exhausting 17-hour days for six days a week. He compared the experience to pushing a piano across a beach. The conditions were also miserable for the actors, who had to be coated with gel and spritzed with water to appear sweltering in the harsh environment, when in reality the average temperature was only in the 40s. Tui constantly worried that the air would get cold enough to see the actor's breath, which wouldn't be very convincing for a purportedly scorching alien world. The isolation of the shooting location also took a toll on the cast and crew. As Cole Hauser said, it's good for focus, but there's nothing out there but kangaroos, rocks, and dirt. It can get you a little demented. Things began to improve once the production shifted to a Queensland soundstage where Tui and the crew could control the environment, but even that presented its own set of challenges. Most of the cast members had not worked with blue screen before and found some difficulty adjusting to acting against nothing. Limitations of budget and space also necessitated some creative solutions, like using the title's convenient darkness to hide the nearby boundaries of the soundstage. Backlit cutouts and forced perspective helped create the illusion of a horizon deep in the distance, even though it was really just a few feet away. For the final gauntlet run, only a hundred foot stretch of rocky ravine was actually constructed, requiring the actors to dash through the same section over and over, while the filmmakers used every lighting trick and camera angle possible to make the canyon seem longer. But even as things seemed to be back on track, there was still yet another potential catastrophe casting a shadow over pitch black. The financing studio, Polygram Pictures, went bankrupt in the middle of shooting. Tui continued filming without knowing each day whether he'd have money to finish, or even a studio to release the completed movie, and there was a dreaded discussion about going straight to video. Fortunately, Universal came to the rescue and picked up the movie for theatrical distribution. Besides his smooth head and brawny physique, Riddick's most notable trait is the eye shine that lets him see in the dark. But even that came with complications. The shimmering iris effect was accomplished with CGI for some scenes, but otherwise Vin Diesel wore bulky prototype contact lenses, which he said felt like having hubcaps on his eyes. But they weren't just uncomfortable to wear. After the first day of shooting, nobody could get the lenses out of his eyes, and an optometrist from three hours away had to be flown out to the remote filming location to extract them. Despite the alarming incident, Diesel insisted on continuing to wear the lenses for the remainder of the shoot, demonstrating his commitment to the character and willingness to suffer for his art. Speaking of eyes, one of the movie's most squirm-inducing scenes did not involve the extraterrestrial monsters, but instead the moment where Johns injects morphine directly into his tear duct. Cole Hauser had learned of the method while talking with heroin addicts as part of his character research. He brought the suggestion to David Tui, who decided to incorporate it, and Hauser performed the act himself, despite the producers wishing otherwise. One clever related detail you might have missed, Johns stores his morphine stash in red shotgun shells, while live rounds are blue. During the climactic scuffle with Riddick, Johns inadvertently loads a red morphine shell when he needs his weapon the most, becoming a victim of both the alien predator and his own addiction. To generate the movie's uniquely alien skies, Tui and cinematographer David Egby used a risky process called bleach bypass, which involves altering the original camera negative during development to retain the silver nitrate in the film, creating a special scattered light and redistribution of color on the image. 
The process was generally not allowed by studios because it affected the original negatives and wasn't guaranteed to work, but the final effect helped give Pitch Black its distinct aesthetic. Tui later joked that between the striking otherworldly sky, the monochromatic alien sonic sight, and Riddick's ultraviolet night vision, he nearly ran out of options on the visual spectrum. Another challenge the director had faced during filming was ego problems, because he had created a story with three leads, who were each convinced they were the main character. The original plan was for Riddick to perish at the end instead of Fry, but Tui had wisely reconsidered that while filming. And sure enough, during the editing and test screening process, it became overwhelmingly clear that Riddick was the favorite. Tui further pushed the character forward in editing, opening the movie with a new voiceover from Riddick, and essentially telling the story from his perspective. Pitch Black was released in theaters on February 18, 2000. The R-rated movie opened in fourth place with a decent $14 million, but positive reviews and word of mouth helped turn the movie into a modest sleeper success, ultimately ending its box office run with $53 million worldwide on a cost of $22 million. Then the movie became a massive hit on home video, and Riddick grew into a popular sci-fi character, even as Vin Diesel himself was becoming a household name, thanks to box office smashes The Fast and the Furious and Triple X. Universal wanted more of the Riddick character, but not necessarily another contained sci-fi horror movie, so Tui and Diesel reunited for The Chronicles of Riddick, which was significantly larger in scope and budget. It was accompanied by the animated side story Dark Fury and the video game prequel Escape from Butcher Bay, but the PG-13 rated 2004 movie was met with indifferent audiences and financial disappointment, barely grossing its $110 million production cost at the worldwide box office. It seemed like Riddick would go back in the shadows after that. But that was hardly the final appearance of our favorite Furian. When Universal approached Diesel about a cameo in the 2006 Fast and Furious sequel, Tokyo Drift, he agreed, on the condition the studio relinquished the Riddick rights to him. While the character was kept active with a second video game appearance, Diesel and Tui toiled for several years on a third movie, eventually returning Riddick to his roots in 2013 with another independently financed R-rated encounter with hostile alien critters. It's been more than two decades since Pitch Black first introduced the intergalactic badass and helped turn Vin Diesel into a major action star. And while all of his space adventures were difficult to make, given the tenacity of Diesel and filmmaker David Tui, we should still expect more Chronicles of Riddick. Because there's one thing we know about the character. Strong survival instinct.